Hi everyone, I'm Miriam Goldby. I'm the director of the International Shipping Law LLM at uh, the Centre for Commercial Law Studies at Queen Mary uh, University of London. Um, and joining me today is Dr. Antigoni Lukotrafiti, who is um, our expert on aviation law. Um, and between us, we're going to take you through um, a, an overview of the LLM program, uh, what to expect, um, and uh, essentially um, uh, some tips on how to do well on the program. So I'm going to start by sharing my screen so you can see uh, the slides um, that uh, we prepared for you today. Um, uh, now, if you'd like to uh, make sure that our videos don't obscure the slides, um, you can uh, select side view um, from, from the menu at the top of your screen. Uh, what this will do is it will move our um, uh, my, my video to one side so that you can get an unobscured view of the slides. Okay, so uh, this is an introduction to your program. Um, and I'm going to start with uh, essentially the main things we expect you to do or we recommend that you do uh, during um, your program over the next academic year. First thing, of course, it goes without saying, uh, we do expect you to study hard. Um, it's, it's a challenging program, it's at master's level, postgraduate level, and we do expect um, a strong performance from our students. We are here to give you all the support you need to do well, um, but at the end of the day it is down to you and down to the work you put in. Now uh, bear in mind that um, doing well on the LLM program, getting the grades, uh, means employment opportunities going forward and again we have support services our uh, law career services you can see this here on the right um, where you will get uh, lots of support this includes being notified of internship opportunities and job opportunities that are relevant to your program um, it also means uh, getting, being able to get someone to look at your CV, doing a practice interview, essentially making the most of our um, uh, support network. Uh, a second thing we recommend that you do during your studies, during your year on the programme, is to network. And the first people you should be networking with are your colleagues. Make sure you uh, get to know your colleagues. Most of our students um, go on to uh, um, get prestigious positions, very strong jobs, very good jobs across the world. And provided you get to know them and you stay in touch after the program, this will be the basis of a very good network for you going forward. We also have a LinkedIn uh, shipping law and insurance law alumni group um, and we invite all our graduates to join the alumni group so, so as to increase your network in this field. And then we also recommend that you attend as many events as possible, not just shipping and the aviation events but events across the board in commercial and financial law. And I will talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, we also, as I said earlier, we organize a number of internships for our students. Um, that has been uh, somewhat suspended this year uh, because of the COVID-19 situation. Um, but we, we do expect things to ease up eventually. Uh, and hopefully during your academic year. And in this case, our internships, uh, uh, our internship program, um, hopefully will uh, be reinstated. Finally, uh, we also have a program that you uh, can benefit from, um, whether or not um, uh, restrictions uh, and social distancing remain in place. This is our mentoring programme where uh, students are invited to apply. 
to join the program and are allocated a mentor who is usually um, a, a very experienced uh, professional in the field that you are studying in. Um, now, this, this person will, will mentor you, give you um, insights into how to develop your career and provide a sounding board for your ideas and your ambitions. It's been a very successful program. It grows every year um, and our students have benefited enormously from it. Now, um, I'll move on to the structure of your degree. Uh, very uh, simply, you will have to do 150 credits worth of taught modules um, and a 10,000 word dissertation that is worth 30 credits. Together, these total 180 credits, which is the number of credits you need to get a master's degree. Now, of the taught modules, 90 credits uh, have to be from among the shipping law modules we offer. But you can also take 60 credits from any other specialization at CCLS. Um, and this is very important because one advantage CCLS has over all of the other institutions in the UK offering shipping law is the vast range of modules that we offer across the board in commercial law. So um, to, to give you an idea, we have expertise in trade law, very important to shipping and to aviation. We have um, expertise in insurance law and financial law. Again, both of these financial sectors are extremely important to shipping, which relies on finance in order to be able to operate and also relies on insurance, as we're going to see later on in this presentation. We have expertise in dispute resolution, in technology law, in uh, intellectual property law. All of these areas are very, very important to um, shipping, um, as you will see, because it's an industry that is interconnected in many ways with a number of other areas of commerce. Uh, what about the dissertation? Well, this is um, a, a research project in an area of your choice within the shipping law specialization. The two main advantages of doing a dissertation in your master's degree are, first of all, developing research and writing skills. These are extremely important to any career in law. You need to be able to research things, research problems, research questions, research issues, and you need to be able to communicate what you've found. So um, it, it's, it's a very important exercise from the skills perspective. The second reason why it's a very important exercise is that it will allow you to specialize in an area which you think will advance your career. And this is any area of your choice, provided it is related to shipping law. Uh, so we, we don't currently offer a taught module in ship finance, for example, but we've had a number of students in the past who have done a dissertation in ship finance and have found it extremely useful in their careers because this is what they ended up doing uh, when they joined international law firms. Um, incidentally, we do have a public webinar on ship finance, which is taking place on Wednesday. Uh, I'll provide further details at the end of this presentation and uh, you are all welcome to register and attend should you wish. Now, how are mo modules taught? Well, essentially, the, the COVID-19 lockdown has um, basically uh, uh, encouraged us, urged us to become more flexible in the, in the way we provide content. And you'll see that um, going forward, our content is going to be structured around taught sessions, so live teaching. This can either take place face-to-face -face or uh, if needed, online as I am doing this presentation now, but it will be what we call synchronous. It will be live. Um, so everything is structured around our interactive synchronous teaching. 
but there will be a number of activities you will do in your own time, either before or after the synchronous teaching, to help reinforce your understanding and make sure that you are learning in the best way possible. So these will include um, uh, th the following uh, features. First of all, recorded or written introductions to different topics. Uh, these will be posted online in advance for pre-seminar preparation. So you will be uh, invited to listen to a recording um, or to read a written introduction to the topic we're going to discuss in the synchronous uh, taught session. Um, you will also be given a list of essential and further reading and we recommend that you do the essential reading prior to the synchronous session. Now we've always done this. This has always been in place. The, um, the reading list which is distributed prior to any taught session with students being asked to read so that th then they can participate interactively during the teaching. Um, quizzes to test your basic understanding. Again, this is something we used also uh, before um, the lockdown, uh, but this will become now more structured. So this you will, you will undertake a quiz online. This will be self-assessed, but the instructor will have access to the results. So during the synchronous session, we can give you feedback and we can give you further explanations. Then you will have your seminar or your webinar. Uh, this is interactive synchronous teaching. Uh, and this is what you probably have been used to in your previous degrees. And then we, will, we do something which we've also always done, uh, which is that we distribute a case study for you to prepare in advance. And then we discuss it in uh, a synchronous teaching session and you will be expected to participate in the discussion. Now, uh, using these methods, we have found that um, students tend to develop very good analytical skills and those who engage with these methods and who interact during class and participate in discussions uh, tend to do very, very well in their assessment. Now, this brings us to assessment, how are modules assessed? So the most common mode of assessment is examination. Uh, you've all done examinations before, you uh, probably have an idea of what they entail, but what we, what we always do in this programme is we have formative assessments. That is, this is um, uh, an assessment, a test run, um, so uh, sometimes it's called a mock exam, which does not count towards your final grade, but where you get individualized feedback. That is, you are given uh, feedback on your own attempted answer, detailed feedback, and the idea of the feedback is to tell you how to improve, um, what you can do better. Now, some modules are assessed by essay. Again, the idea of assessing you by essay or coursework is to ensure that you develop the research and writing skills that um, you will be expected to have when you join uh, the shipping law workforce. Uh, again, now this brings us, research and writing skills brings us to the dissertation. Now, many students have lots of questions about the dissertation uh, when they come to CCLS. Uh, they normally ask, what is it? How do I choose a topic? What supervision do I receive? And how do I approach research and writing? Now, uh, essentially what the dissertation is, as I explained earlier, very uh, um, simply, you choose a topic, you discuss it with a supervisor, and uh, your supervisor will guide you towards writing the best thing you can on that topic. How do you choose a topic? Again, as I mentioned earlier, think about what might help you in your career or what you might be interested in doing going forward in your career. Now, the supervision consists of three meetings. You have a total of three meetings 
and your supervisor, each supervisor approaches these slightly differently, but essentially the idea is that you go to meetings prepared to discuss your work and not just what you've done, but what you've had problems doing, because that's the supervisor's role. They're, they're there as a guide to help you deal with research problems that every researcher faces. Um, how do I approach research and writing? Uh, essentially, you need to be organized in terms of how much time you allocate and what tasks you undertake. And uh, you need to make sure that you don't treat your dissertation as an afterthought. Do give it the attention it deserves uh, because 30 credits is quite a lot. And this is one uh, module which students tend to do very well on if they put in the work. We will have special dissertations. Uh, usually they take place around October, November time in order to get you started and to make sure uh, that you are um, uh, on track to produce the best piece of writing you can by the submission date. Um, now, the next couple of slides are basically a, a summary of what I've already said. Um, we are always available to discuss your ideas with you. Um, a couple of questions that students also ask is uh, how do I write something original? I don't have that many words and I don't have that much time. And that is perfectly true. What is meant by originality is that this needs to be your own work. So you need to um, select a research question and respond to that research question. And your writing should not be a reproduction or a rehashing of something someone's already written before. So there must be an element of it, which is your own idea. Um, overlap with modules, some overlap is permitted, but your writing, again, as I've just said, must not consist entirely of material covered in class. You need to go into more depth. So, so we might have, for example, raised, uh, uh, discussed a case in class, which you think raises uh, very interesting issues and you'd like to delve into those issues in more detail. That is perfectly fine. It doesn't matter that we discuss the case in class, but you need to go beyond what was discussed in class in a significant way. Now, there are, um, uh, depending on the topic you select for your dissertation, for shipping law students, there, there is the uh, option of IMO internships. The program has been suspended for now until further notice, but we expect that by next summer, when you are uh, doing the uh, main chunk of work on your dissertation, uh, this program will probably be in place again. Now, I have hyperlinked the uh, website to the slide. Um, I don't know if uh, the organizer is going to distribute these slides after the, um, after the presentation, uh, but what I'll do is I'll share the link with anyone who uh, is interested. Another very important external program that is relevant to your dissertations is a program organised by Maritime UK, which is a representative body of the entire UK shipping industry. Um, essentially, they have selected 10 UK universities to participate in a competition, uh, nominating students to present their research to an industry audience. Now, we are the only law school that participates in this competition. All the other universities send uh, students from other disciplines. So they might send students doing uh, marine uh, engineering, for example, or naval architecture or uh, uh, maritime business. Uh, but we're the only law school who participates in this. Um, I've put some details on this slide. I, I don't have time to go through them in detail, uh, but essentially it's, uh, there, there are 
many, many advantages to being nominated for this competition and even better if you are selected as at the finalist. So it's an extra incentive if you like to um, uh, do well in your dissertation and make a good impression. Now, uh, the inaugural competition was in 2018. This is when the competition was launched and our student won. So this is our student, Tessa Jones here uh, with uh, Princess Anne there um, and with the organizers of the competition and she's holding the trophy because she won. Um, and this is essentially the, um, the timetable, which you can find online. So uh, let's move on to the taught modules and then I'll talk a little bit about the context and how we approach teaching. And then I will pass you on to Dr. Likotrafiti. I see that I have about uh, five or six minutes left before I have to uh, pass the word on. So I'll be quick. Um, these are the modules we will be offering um, next year, uh, for the next academic year. Um, you will see that there are three foundational modules, each of 30 credits. This is the basic information that you require in order to have um, a foundation in shipping law, in international shipping law. Um, we recommend that unless you've already covered these subjects in a previous degree, or you are familiar with them, for example, because of your work experience, we do recommend that you take these three uh, modules. Um, besides these three modules, there's a number of specialist modules you can uh, select from. And some of these are only offered by CCLS. So for example, no other institution offers a module on protection and indemnity clubs. Uh, no other institution offers a module on maritime arbitration. And no other institution offers a module on international regulation of shipping. These are specialist modules. They are research based. That is, they are developed on the basis of the research we do ourselves. Uh, they are not textbook based. So you will see that when you are doing your reading for these modules, you will be referred to uh, publications um, that cover the field, but most of the readings you will be asked to do will consist of scholarly articles, um, academic writing. So there will be a, a, a large variety of materials that you will be referred to. And a lot of the writing is uh, by uh, your own um, lecturers. Um, we also offer modules on aviation, which again, it's very rare to find this in other institutions. Um, uh, and I won't dwell on those because Dr. Likotrafiti is going to talk to you about them in more detail later on. So these will be your teachers for next academic year. There will be myself and I teach on all of those modules listed there. So you might get a bit tired of me by the end of the year. Um, there's Dr. Likotrafiti, whom you're going to meet later. There's Professor Hilton Staniland. Uh, Professor Sir Bernard Ricks, who was formerly uh, Lord Justice of Appeal, uh, and Dr. David Tester, who is our newest recruit. Now, you can find um, information about all of us in uh, our profile pages on the CCLS website, uh, except for Dr. Tester, who um, has joined very, very recently, so he doesn't yet have a profile page. Uh, but I have put some information um, about him on this slide. Um, you will see that he does not just have uh, lecturing experience, but he's also worked for a number of years um, within Europe's largest uh, ship registry as a regulator. And he will be leading the module on international regulation of shipping, which as I indicated is uh, unique to us. Um, Finally, a quick note, we have a number of practitioners who participate in our sessions and give guest classes. This is to give you practitioner insight. 
Um, some of them, so for example, uh, uh, Mr. Jonathan Moss is um, a CCLS alumnus. Um, so is, uh, her name isn't there, but it, so is um, Renata Benning. Um, she's also our alumna. She now works for the world's largest BNI club. And she comes and gives a guest lecture to our students. Uh, but as you can see, we have guest lecturers from across the board in the shipping industry. Uh, there are also some from the aviation industry, uh, which uh, Dr. Licotrafiti will tell you um, about later on. Now, I'll, I'm going to give you a quick bit of contextual information about shipping, about the shipping industry, uh, and why it is so important. Uh, as an industry and as a contributor to world to the global economy. Um, so I've put some statistics there. It is essential to our life to have shipping as a method of transportation of goods. Um, probably everything surround, surrounding you uh, or most of the things that surround you where you're sitting right now were uh, brought from elsewhere. And chances are, well, 90% of them at least, uh, were transported using ships. Um, so essentially, modern life would be impossible without shipping. Um, the ships themselves, they are very expensive assets. They are highly technically sophisticated. The shipbuilding industry is an extremely important industry. Ship finance, again, very important. And ensuring, because the shipping business is such a high risk business, ensuring all of this is, uh, again, crucial. So you will come across, you will come face to face with transport and the importance of transport. Uh, wherever you decide to work in the commercial law field. We will be discussing a number of things, um, a, a number of perspectives um, when we do our lectures. The way we approach the teaching of this topic is to give you multiple perspectives about how it works. So we will look uh, at international law. After all, the program is called uh, International Shipping Law. Um, this consists of international conventions and standard contract terms. So privately made law. There are a number of associations, including, for example, Ancitral, including the CMI, including BIMCO, that make rules for shipping. And some of this is privately made law but it is so widely adopted and implemented that it is essentially law. Um, we will be looking very closely at the commercial context, so we won't be looking at the law in a vacuum. We think it's extremely important that our students acquire an understanding of the industry to which the law applies, because otherwise the law does not make sense. We will be focusing on contractual breaches and their resolution. So as I mentioned earlier, we do have modules on dispute resolution, which are not offered elsewhere. Um, uh, we will be focusing, you will see rather a lot on the English courts interpretation of transnational and international law. And this is for a very specific reason. It's because very often in a large majority of cases, English law is the chosen applicable law of contracts entered into in the shipping field. So uh, contracts, shipping contracts, including charter parties, including uh, bills of lading, including financial contracts, including insurance contracts, tend to be governed by English law. So the English court's interpretation becomes very, very important to your studies. We will also look at current industry developments and how the law responds to practice. Now, just to give you a quick idea of how we approach the contextual issues, 
this graph, now I, I know lawyers hate numbers and lawyers hate graphs, but bear with me because this is really very important. Um, this is a graph of the Baltic Dry Index showing the last five years. And even if you know nothing about economics and markets, you will see that it goes up and down a lot. Essentially, this is an index of what is charged in freight. Okay, so what ship owners charge in order to carry goods. And these freight rates are used when entering into charter party agreements. That is agreements where I agree to rent you my ship, essentially. I've agreed to rent you my ship and this is how much I'm going to charge you. Now, you will see that since the end of last year, between the uh, last few months, the, the last couple of months of last year, and I'm going to point to it with my cursor here, hopefully you can see that. Okay, between there, which is the last few months, couple of months of 2019, and the first few months of 2020, there was a massive drop. Okay? So if I entered into a contract there to rent your ship and I've agreed to pay you this amount, okay, between 1500 and 1750, yes, and then here, just one month into the contract, I find that I could rent another ship or the exact same ship for 750. It's a massive drop, massive drop. Um, I'm going to want to find a way to get out of that contract. Because if I get out of this contract, I can rent the same ship for a much, much lower price. And imagine how much more true that would be if I rented my ship in the middle of last year for 12 months, say. So, so the, the economics of it, what is happening in the real world, is very important to the law. Because at this point here, lawyers are going to see a large number of disputes. People trying to get out of contracts, uh, people alleging that the other party breached. Okay, this is the same with the Shanghai Containerized Freight Index. You will see since the middle of the first month of 2020, again, a big drop and is starting to go up a little bit now. Uh, this is for containerized freight. So this is not where I, I rent my ship to you. It's where I agree to carry a container of goods for you. So again, uh, very, very significant drops in the market. And this gives rise to disputes. This gives rise to economic difficulties. So for example, an attempt to renegotiate loans and other financial contracts. And it means a lot of work for lawyers usually. Now incidents at sea are the other thing that generates a lot of legal activity. Um, incidents at sea generate activity in two ways, uh, well more than two ways but two main ways. First of all coastal states have an incentive to regulate because incidents in, at sea tend to cause harm to the environment, they tend to cause harm to persons and very often they involve criminal acts. So incidents at sea are of relevance to regulation. Second, um, incidents at sea cause contracts to come into operation, namely insurance contracts. There are three types of insurance contracts. Hull and machinery, so the ship itself, damage to the ship. Cargo, so damage to or loss of cargo and production and indemnity, which essentially, as you will see if you take this module, is everything else. So all kinds of liability 
that the ship owner becomes subject to as a result of the incident. So liability, for example, to the other vessel if the incident involved a collision or liability to coastal states if the incident involved marine pollution. Liability to crews and passengers if people were injured. So all of this is really important. Incidents at sea generate a huge amount of legal activity. Now one other contract that is very relevant here is salvage contracts. So entering into a contract with um, a, a, a salvage company to go and save your ship essentially. And this is something you would be covering in wet shipping law. Now, um, I, I won't dwell on the rest of the slides, but essentially I gave you some more contextual information. Ships are registered. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, our newest recruit, Dr. Tessa, he uh, has worked for a number of years for the Maltese Ship Registry, which is the largest in Europe. Um, and uh, you'll see here that uh, the major flags of registration are different from the major countries of ownership where the owners are domiciled, which, is, which are listed here. And this is significant because the question arises, and this is something you would deal with your, within your module, is how do you regulate? Who regulates? Because as, as you will know, states have sovereignty and states have the right to regulate. They have a jurisdiction with, within which they, they are able to regulate. So the question um, arises, who regulates? Is it the country where the owner is domiciled? Does that country have the duty to do anything? Is it the country where the ship is registered, which could be different? As you can see, the um, countries listed here, are, apart from China, are different from the countries listed here. Um, now, th these are some pictures of incidents. I like showing them to students because you need to wonder, I mean, how, how does this happen? How does a ship not see another massive vessel that's right in front of it? Well, the answer usually is it takes a ship a very long time to turn and get out of the way. So, so this is something you would be uh, discussing in wet shipping law. Uh, and finally, insurance. As I said, uh, shipping is inherently high risk. We have um, so so uh, marine insurance is the earliest form of insurance you'll find anywhere in the world. Um, you can see here, this is taken from the IUMI statistics. That's the International Union of Marine Insura Insurers. Uh, these are statistics about um, marine insurance and how well or how badly it is doing. And you will see that it's um, not been doing very well recently. In fact, a number of marine insurers have been uh, uh, coming out of the market. Uh, this is because, well, for a number of reasons, ships have been getting bigger so that when, a when there's an incident, the losses are greater. Um, now, one area which has done better is cargo insurance over the past few years since 2018 because there has been an uptick in world trade. People have been trading more. But these statistics are for 2019. They were published in December. So it will be very interesting to see going forward what is going to be the impact of COVID-19. And we have organized another seminar this week, which is on Friday, which is on the impact of COVID-19 on the insurance industry, including aviation and marine insurance. And that's a little note on PNI clubs, which I explained earlier. I'll stop here and I will pass the word over to Dr. Licotrafiti. And please do ask any questions 
um, should you wish. Thank you, Miriam. Thank you very much for the fascinating presentation. I would also like to welcome our students to Queen Mary, to the Center for Commercial Law Studies. Welcome on our program. Um, as I'm speaking to the screen now, I have realized how much I have missed the students. So I really hope that things normalize and we um, uh, meet you in person on campus. Uh, so the, I will present, um, I'm not going to present the, the individual modules on aviation on air transport law that we offer, but I will um, draw your attention to air transport law. So Miriam, if you can uh, show the next slide, I don't know if I, can I do it myself? Let's see. You, Miriam, could you, could you display? Yes. Okay, so Miriam already mentioned that um, we are unique at CCLS since we offer um, two modules on air transport law. Why should we focus on this field of law? Why is aviation important? Unlike shipping, which is cargo sent cargo centric aviation is passenger centric so it focuses very much on passengers it's about uh, transportation of passengers connectivity matters a lot and we realize that now uh, when because of COVID-19 aircraft are grounded uh, and a lot of communities remote communities uh, suffer uh, from uh, lack of connectivity to the mainland. Imagine uh, islands, isolated islands, for example. Uh, however, a, a cargo is also transported by air. And if you look at the figures, it's just 1% uh, um, in terms of volume, but this 1% represents 33% of the value. So the cargo, which is carried by air, uh, is valuable. So basically diamonds are carried by air and uh, el gadgets, uh, electronic devices. If you buy a laptop uh, today, it costs a thousand pounds. If you buy it uh, two months down the road, it costs 900 pounds. So it is very important that uh, uh, such kind of goods are transported by air. Miriam, if we can go back to the previous slide, please. Uh, yes, that's right. Um, nowadays, when you catch your when you catch your plane in the belly of the aircraft, together with your suitcases, there is also cargo, uh, and you have perishables, perishable goods, so flowers from uh, Holland, and you can have uh, luxury cars and such kind of. These types of cargo are transported by air. So aviation is a very important industry for the economy. And you see another figure that it accounts for 3.6% of the world's GDP. Now, even though aviation is so important for the global economy, unfortunately and unluckily, little attention has been paid to air transport law. A lot of attention has been paid to aviation in other disciplines or by other disciplines like engineering, uh, economics, uh, management, but in law, uh, I'm afraid we have neglected aviation. This is something that the Center for, Com for Commercial Law Studies has identified and uh, has addressed by offering uh, modules on aviation. So Miriam, if we can go to the to the next slide, please. Thank you. And the fact that lawyers uh, have under researched this area is something that I kill. The International Civil Aviation Organization has also highlighted. Now, I kill. I don't know if you are familiar with it. It is an international organization. It is a United Nations uh, body. It is based in Montreal in Canada. Uh, ICAO was established in 1944 during the Second World War. At that time, the countries, uh, several countries gathered in Chicago and 
regulated international civil aviation. Uh, they signed the Chicago Convention, which is one, not one of the most important, most successful, it is the most successful international convention that we have. It has been signed and ratified by 193 countries, so by everybody, almost everybody. It is a, an international convention that we apply, that we respect, and ICAO is the watchdog, really, the guardian of this uh, convention. So ICAO, this body, um, it has invited the Council, one of its bodies, to take all possible action to promote the teaching of air law. And it has also urged the states, these 193 states, to do the same. Uh, this is what we do at the Center for Commercial Law Studies. And now if we go to the next slide, please. Uh, on employability. Thank you, Miriam. I know that you all worry about your employability after graduating. The times are difficult. COVID-19 is a challenging time. Uh, and I know that you are wondering where can I work, uh, when I will graduate, if I focus on aviation. Every year I offer uh, a seminar on, on employability to my shipping and aviation law students where I uh, provide advice on how to search for jobs, I provide websites, tips, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. We will do the same this year. Uh, very briefly, uh, if you are interested in a career in an international organization like ICAO or the International Air Transport Association, which is an, the, the Airlines uh, Association, it is also based in Montreal, uh, or if you want to work for the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development in Paris, uh, it has also regional offices elsewhere. Uh, the OECD has a, a, a division that focuses on transport. I was working there before joining uh, Queen Mary. Uh, you can work for the United Nations. In this case, you, work, you are a functionary, you work for an international organization, uh, these are high profile jobs, very well paid, tax free salaries you get if you work there. You can work for the public sector, become uh, a civil servant. You may want to work for a, a civil aviation authority, uh, for a ministry of transportation. Uh, Miriam, before she mentioned all the stakeholders, uh, uh, um, uh, that that um, that you have in shipping, in, you have to think along the same lines with respect to aviation. It's the airlines, it's the airports, it's the, it's the air navigation service service providers, it's the aircraft manufacturers. There are thousands of, sm of small and medium sized enterprises in Europe and elsewhere in the world. Uh, that are into uh, aeronautics. So the, the value chain, the entire value chain uh, is uh, enormous. It's not just the airlines. The airlines are the most visible because they are mobile assets and we see them in the air. Uh, you may want to work as an in-house lawyer for an airline, an airport, etc., or, or as an aviation consultant for a law firm that specializes in aviation. And again, when we will do the employability seminar, I will point you to the relevant um, uh, law firms. And the last word I would like to say about these modules, uh, we have been offering them now since, I believe, 2017-18. Every year, the feedback we get from students is terrific. So uh, in terms of student satisfaction, these modules receive the highest of score. It's virtually five out of five. So I can guarantee you that you will enjoy these modules. They are research-led, led, teaching is research-led, um, and they open a window to areas that you uh, haven't thought of, which, however, are very important uh, from a legal point of view. 